What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode two of the Everything Club. I am one of your three humble hosts, Keelan Luke Morrissey. Uh, joining me today, are my two best friends, George Mitchell and Noah Boink. Holla, boys. What's, what's up? Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Hi, it's it's going really good, Mr. Morrissey. How are you? <laughs> doing quite well, doing quite well. Uh <laughs> we're still we're still finding our groove with these intros, but we'll get there. Uh so yes, this is episode two of The Everything Club, our new podcast where we discuss everything under the sun in terms of entertainment, from movies to TV shows to books to music. We uh we're here to talk about storytelling, art, entertainment, everything. So, yeah, like I said, my name is Keelan Luke Morrissey. I am an independent filmmaker, author, poet, photographer, lover of stories and arts. And as of as of now, I am a podcast host as well. So I can add that to the resume. Uh, Noah, why don't you uh, go on and introduce yourself to our lovely listeners? Hello, I am uh, Noah Boink. I am um, an electrical apprentice. Ooh, that sounds pretty hardcore. <laughs> <laughs> Electrical apprentice. That is like the lowest tier, so it's even better. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the new Star Wars show, The Acolyte. The Can't Electrical Say apprentice. I've heard of that. Anyway, no, I, I I am an amateur actor. Only experience is with KM Productions and Keelan and George. So, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And now I can also add podcast host to my resume. <laughs> And George, the acolyte, the acolyte isn't out yet. No, the acolyte is not out yet. Okay, okay, that's that's what I thought. I was like, "There's no shot." I missed it. But okay, wait. Um, yes, hello, listeners. Uh, I'm George. I'm an engineer, an entrepreneur, a researcher, and an inventor. Um, I'm uh, I'm I'm here, and I'm doing I'm doing fun stuff. And today we're going to be talking about um, Rebel Moon. Oh uh, yeah, which is, which is really which is really fun. <laughs> as as well back to keelan yeah so george quick question that the listeners have been just hounding me to ask you is when are you going to give me superpowers um that we well, this is this has been a topic for that, that we've discussed for a very long time um extremely theoretically um, no very pra- very time, practically the, time, <laughs> the the timeline would depend on the scope of work uh, um yeah. which at the moment is crazy mm. so uh prob- probably not within the near future <laughs> uh but we could we could, we can talk about that um at 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 at, at, at any other um episode how about of right now everything. how about this episode how about- <laughs> uh, see how see there's the thing that we have we have so much to talk about about rebel moon that i don't know if we're gonna hit the time listen i'm, I'm just giving uh, the giving the listeners a little insight into our banter george see see i'm a i'm a creative storyteller george is a biomedical engineer we're quite quite far apart on the spectrum of uh professions but uh but we come together because he has pledged to use his gift in the medical industry to uh somehow you know, bioengineer me to have superpowers. And that's, that's an agreed upon uh, thing that will okay. happen. And we'll keep I you updated. I haven't committed Probably to on that. a per episode basis. We'll let you know how that's going. And uh, I'm yeah, here Noah can too. For me. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> well, Noah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I assume I would be, you know, the first trial. Noah would be the second, the second one to be infused with the superpowers. Oh, I don't have to be the test assume. dummy. Let's go. I'm proud of that. <laughs> Noah gets the more refined That's... version. <laughs> like, I'm like the horrible, yeah, hideous I... experiment gone wrong. <laughs> and then Noah gets the good red, the good red skull and Captain America. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> For movies, music, books, and more, join Keelan, Noah, and George, your ultimate entertainment hub. Welcome to the everything. Club. but yes yes uh today we are talking about rebel moon part one a child of fire directed by zachary snyder this is a netflix film netflix original uh yeah directed by my favorite director zach snyder we watched this movie back in december when it dropped and it part december, two comes really? out yeah, man, December. That's wild. Yeah, it was like right around Christmas time, I think. Uh, but yeah, part two comes out this month. Uh, Rebel Moon, part two, The Scar Giver. And then sometime in the summer, we are getting, in true Zack Snyder style, 
director's cuts for both part one and part two, which will total six hours in runtime. So I could not be more excited about that. Uh, but t- <laughs> but today we are discussing the Netflix version of Rebel Moon, Child of Fire, part one. If I'm not mistaken, um, I, I thought that the second part actually comes out at the end of next week. The end of next week? Yeah, that might next be. Friday. It's April 19th, I believe, right? Yeah. April 19th? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's, okay. that's next Friday. I, I know it well. I have a deadline on that day. So makes, <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly when April 19th is. Yeah, yeah, when I was going back and re-watching it today to make sure I knew what I was talking about, I saw that it said part two coming out next Friday. <laughs> that's crazy. That that really snuck up on us. It's, yeah. it's cool. It's a unique. It's a unique release model where, like, like the sequel to the first movie comes out five months after the first movie. It's kind of a cool situation. Um, but yeah. So Noah, we are gonna watch Rebel Moon when uh, you come up to Chicago at the end of this month for the big Comic Con C two E two, which George said he doesn't want to come to because he hates us. So okay. <laughs> look out for those pictures on Vero True Social. You can see all the banter that we do and all the excitement that we have. Oh, that's right, nah, folks. That's no. right. Why would you say that? <laughs> <laughs> I've converted him. It's worked. <laughs> no, no, no. Wait, this is actually relevant because Vero is the social media platform of choice of Zack Snyder and played a massive uh, instrumental role in the campaign to release the Snyder Cut and 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 all of that stuff. So so Vero, to those who don't know, is a social media app that came out in like 2016, 2017, and it gained a lot of followers because of Zack Snyder. So a lot a lot of his fan base went onto that app and that's where he posts a lot of uh behind the scenes pictures and whatnot. Um but it's a cool app. Everyone everyone should check it out. Um it's a it's 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 bumping over there. So, uh, boys, how how are you doing though? Before we before we dive into today's topic, uh, what's what's new? George, I'll let you go first. I'm doing pretty good, pretty good. Um, the semester's wrapping up, which is which is funny. My la- my last semester, which is very exciting. Woo! Um, it's uh, it's it's exceptional. Um, like the weather's getting better, which is always great. Just helps with like the mental fortitude of these <laughs> of the coming weeks, and um. Let's see. I had an amazing breakfast burrito the other day. Um, <laughs> in, 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 um, Describe the, it in the, detail, please. But, yes, but I want to hear. Well, I, I will. The <laughs> breakfast, bur- like the the outside, instead of a tor- instead of like the like a tortilla, they ma- they made it in a, into a crepe. Um, so it was it was it was a breakfast burrito, but they made it with a crepe, and on the inside there was a uh, there was a beef fillet. Um, and they, and they had like all of the other, all of the other incredible parts of the breakfast breeder in there. They had some guac, they had some, had some rice, they had some egg, they had, it was incredible. And I loved it. It was the best. And I've been thinking about it for like a week and a half. So like, so just to be clear, rather than a tortilla for the burrito, it was wrapped yeah. in like a crepe, uh, shell. <laughs> like, what do you call yes. the, what do you call the, the crepe? Exterior? It's a crepe. You just call that the crepe. Interesting. Yeah. That's a crepe. <laughs> Interesting. So, so, so an empty crepe would just be still called a crepe. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Because it's like you add stuff to the crepe. <laughs> this uh. man doesn't know his French pastries. What the heck? <laughs> <laughs> that's like that's like just having a bun and then saying this is a hot dog when there's nothing on it. That's really that's interesting. No, it's like calling it a bun when it's just a bun. You see the analogy I'm drawing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but but that's that, that that's how it's going for me. How how, how are you now? <laughs> I am doing pretty good. Pretty 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 freaking good. Um last week was a very busy week. I'm a big I'm a big sports guy. So uh last week the Cardinals had their home opener and then uh the Battle Hawks are semi-pro slash professional football team uh had their opening day on uh last saturday so and both games i went to both games we won it was awesome so yeah it's i've i've been on a cloud it's been it's been awesome so uh that's amazing bro yeah keelan how about you have you been 
Love to hear it. Love to hear it. Uh, quick question, Noah: Is that my chair that you're sitting in? Did you did you <laughs> obtain is, that chair actually, for me? Yes, yes. <laughs> I finally have a use for it. That's not just storing blankets on. <laughs> I I don't even remember like this transaction occurring. When did that chair transfer ownership? <laughs> Are you kidding? You're, you're, no, I really don't remember. You offered this to me as if it. Were, I think you told me it was your dad's chair. It was just like as we were uh, moving out, or as yeah. as we were moving out of our apartment. You're like, hey, do you want my dad's right. old chair? And I said, That's right. heck yeah, I want your dad's old chair. <laughs> and now I have a use for it. <laughs> After that, about that was three a very years. Memory. I remember. I remember seeing that in his office some years ago. And then yeah, he switched chairs, and now yeah. yeah. Listener, I know this is riveting. Um, <laughs> <anyways>. <laughs> Uh, well, for me, I feel like my development kind of has to be the big development that relates to today's topic, which is I, I flew to New York for two days and attended the release party for the Rebel Moon Part 2 soundtrack, uh, which was also a gallery show for Zack Snyder's portraits of the Rebel Moon characters, which was absolutely surreal. Uh, so I... I actually, I had met Zack Snyder last April. There was an event uh, held in Pasadena called Full Circle. It was a three-day event where he screened his his DC films. Um, and then I, I thought it was super fun. I loved being part of the community. Meeting him in person was awesome. And then I was like, man, I hope that they do something like that again someday. And then come this April, exact same thing happens. He's like, hey, I'm doing this thing in New York. Uh, and if, but, but this was different. This that? It's like, hey, yeah, I'm yeah, doing he this thing in New me. York. <laughs> exactly. He, he he hit me up on Vero, the you know the DMs, and and was like, hey man, it's just. <laughs> uh, no, it was, but but it was it was weirdly under advertised because I remember for la for the the event last April, it was sold out super quickly. I was incredibly lucky to even get a ticket. Whereas this one, the tickets were free, zero dollar tickets. Anyone could go. And which is like weird, but not only that, but, but it was, it was, nobody really was talking about it leading up to it. Like it was very one, like he posted one single, uh, invite on Vero. And I think that was it. That was all the press that was done for this event. So it said, it said, it said, uh, join us for a gallery show and the release party. And, and there were a few musicians who were going to be there, including Jesse Reyes, who is one of my favorite artists. So I'm like, Hey, it's a two for one. I can see Zach's work and I can, catch a show of one of my favorite artists but i i didn't know how it was going to work uh i i mean it's it even said having a ticket does not guarantee you entry and so yeah. i was like i was like uh huh okay i guess this thing is going to be pretty crazy so so I, I fly to new york that day i i go straight from the airport to the event it is torrentially raining we oh by the way i was the fourth person there the fourth person in line <laughs> and i came from out of state and i was the fourth person there <laughs> which and you is didn't crazy. get in they were like nope, oh, no three's no. the max capacity sorry <laughs> yeah exactly they're like yeah it's, this is extremely exclusive only the first three people to get here are allowed entry uh no we we did make it in um and it, but i think because it was a one night event it was mostly just new york locals who were attending and because it was torrentially raining most of the people didn't show up until right before doors opened. Mm -hmm. But me, who d does not have a New York residence, <laughs> I simply had to go straight to the venue. And so that's what I did. It was at the Knockdown Center in Queens. Uh, or I might have, I think, yeah, I think Queens. And after several hours of immense downpour in the freezing cold rain, we finally go in. I am, I mean, literally completely soaked. I So just, just so you know, for the rest of this story, I mean, I was just wet and cold the entire night. Um, <laughs> like, which was, and it was an odd, it was an odd experience. But That's crazy. That's wild. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we, we made it in and it was, I mean, it was, it was awesome. It was, it was well, well worth the wait. Um, massive Netflix banner hanging up in there felt very official very cool uh people started pooling in right right when it hit eight o'clock it, it filled up there was like a main like kind of uh concert hall slash dance floor lots of rebel moon uh vignettes for you to take pictures at they had the space corn from like the movie where you know they grow on the in the village all the they had they had sort of props and stuff um 
And then the main stage had a big Rebel Moon display and the artists would come out one by one and perform. And then on the side, they had a gallery of all of Zach's portraits, which were awesome. These big black and white uh, photos of all the characters. And so, yeah, so, so Zach and his wife, Debbie, who's a producer on all his films, they were there. They came on stage. They announced it. And then the entire cast comes on stage. They were all there. Whoa. Like all of, all of them. (laughs) And that was really cool. Um, And then a few of, so then some of them, I think there was like a red carpet type deal behind the stage that public wasn't allowed access to, but some of the actors would sort of wander through the crowd and, uh, and 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 especially in the gallery room, they would just come along. So I met Ed Scrine, who plays Admiral Noble, the main villain of Whoa, the film. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I I just saw him walking around the gallery. I saw. I actually noticed him standing next to a big portrait of himself, and <laughs> and I, I went up and Dale. talked to him. <laughs> no, I, and, and, and I <laughs> and I went up and talked to him. And uh, Ed, if you're listening. Uh, I mean, all I mean this with all respect in the world. You have a naturally sinister presence, my man. I mean, <laughs> I felt intimidated just talking to you. I was like, man, is this guy going to pull out that fucking club and like bash me? <laughs> like, <laughs> You're going to have um, to beep that out, man. Oh, no, we can curse on this. Oh, we can? Yeah. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> that was I meant to I meant to tell you that before we recorded. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um oh yeah, no, it's this gonna is, get pg-13 in here it's gonna be great this is this is yeah no there's no there's no rating on this podcast we're, we're we're good for whatever colorful language uh but anyways he was he was incredibly nice um he he recommended a, i told him i was a filmmaker he recommended a book to me on filmmaking called uh, rebel without a crew and he and then he said hey man come uh Come back once you've read it, and once you're once you made it big, come back and cast me. And I'm like, you know what? I <laughs> I yeah. just might Ed Scrine. I just might do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's I met, awesome. Yeah, it was crazy. I met Staz Nair, who plays Tarek, who's the long haired guy who doesn't wear a shirt the whole film. No, yeah, love that guy. I, I remember. Love it. I remember him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I met him. Uh, he was also incredibly nice and charming and very sweet guy. Um, he, huh. he was flipping through all these uh there's like a big photo book of of all the portraits that he was flipping through telling stories i met ray fisher who plays Um. darian bloodaxe and cyborg in the dc films which was insane that was surreal uh i and he was he was i mean oh my gosh he was so humble so down to earth i mean i i I can't praise him enough. He was just so like the way that he interacted with everybody was. What did you get on? any pictures with him? <laughs> <laughs> I I did. I did. I did get some pictures with him. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, he was, he was incredibly nice. He claimed to remember me from sitting next to him at the full circle screening of the Snyder cut a year ago. He claimed he was like, really? I never forget a face. He was like, Yeah, I remember. I remember you. I'm like, What? You me? Did you sit next <laughs> to him at the screening of Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I did. Well, I sat adjacent oh, to okay. him. Okay. I sat I sat adjacent to him. Um so I feel like it's it's possible that he remembers me from that and or from the innumerable <laughs> social media posts I've done pertaining <laughs> to his films. <laughs> so but one way or another One or the other. <laughs> He, he, he recognized Either way, me. He knows who you are. <laughs> yeah, which was again insanity. Um, I feel like I've been rambling so long, but this is boys. I've been just itching to tell you all this stuff. Uh, I so then I also met Zach again. That was very cool, very rushed. Um, lots of people trying to meet him. As soon as he entered his gallery, everybody just formed a line to talk to him. Uh, but I got to talk to him. I got to talk to Debbie. Um. Yeah, I really, I mean, it was, it was an amazing experience. I got pictures with all of them. There was even a photographer there who took some really high quality pictures of, of, of the event. And I happened to be in a lot of them. I got, I, I, I literally have like HD pictures of me talking to Ray Fisher, which is crazy. (laughs) 
Um, but yeah, so, so all in all, the event was, the event was incredible. Uh, as a Zack Snyder fan, as a, as a fan of this movie, I, I, yeah, it was, it was amazing. If you go on Vero or, or, or YouTube, you can find videos of the whole thing. I think they live streamed it. Uh, Jesse Reyes's performance was awesome. Uh, yeah, it was, it was amazing. But anyways, I, I, I feel like I, I may have uh, overshared a bit, but I, it does pertain to the, to the, (laughs) to the episode's topic, but, but let's, let's, let's get on into our discussion, boys. Uh, someone want to, someone want to take the lead here? (laughs) (laughs) No, George, you go for it. Well, Okay. (laughs) <laughs> um so uh to, to kick into our first segment here uh a mere a mere 30 minutes into the recording uh <laughs> we will <laughs> we'll, we'll, it's it's time for the speed questions round uh where uh, all of us are going to take turns uh, asking each other uh just a quick question uh and these are all going to be about uh rebel moon and then uh we're just going to keep it moving keep it keep it quick um maybe maybe cut this one a little short uh, to, to to leave time for all, to leave time for the other sections. Sorry, guys. Uh, but I can no no no. Keelan needs to talk about his story. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Keelan needs to talk about all the famous people he's met in the last week. No, I know. I mean, Keelan's just an uh, list listing all of the celebrities that he's that he's made, and he's getting all these fancy new friends and, and like we're, being we're, able we're to being, just being left fly there. to New York on a whim. Yeah. You know, it's. I mean, I had some miles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that makes me feel so much better about it. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so, to kick us off, um, I guess I'll start. Uh, I'll, I guess I'll start with the question. Hey, Noah, yes, uh, sir. If you had to create a symbol for your own rebellion, what would it be, and why? Ooh. A, a, a symbol. This is people are listening here. They're not going to be able to see it. Uh, <laughs> what, do, what do you mean by like, I, a symbol? I would. I would suggest you describe it. Um, that's, 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 that's just that's off the off the dome i don't know if there's, if there's another way you think oh, okay um jeez well okay all right this is just on a whim off the top of my head a lot of symbolism has a lot of uh rebel or like that kind of symbolism has to do with nature and like like particularly birds and plants so i probably have just like a giant tree you know a a a regrowth uh, Mm. of this new or a growth of uh, whoa a growth of this new alliance that i'm trying to uh form so i would have a big tree with a bunch of different roots coming down that all might have like the different names of the groups of people that i am interacting with to make this alliance to make this big tree of of forgiveness and uh and peace tree of forgiveness a tree i don't know that was the first word that came to mind <laughs> it's i i mean i yes. hear i hear tree of forgiveness and i think revolution That's yeah, a rebel <laughs> rebel warriors are known for their forgiveness <laughs> <laughs> keep so, calm and carry on all right <laughs> all right you got a question i do i have a question uh for keelan So, um, it has been, I don't know if it was rumored or if this has been established, but it was originally pitched as a Star Wars movie. Uh, Feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. But do you feel that if it were made into a Star Star Wars movie, that it would be better or worse? And why? Ooh, that's an interesting question. Yeah, so it was originally pitched as a Star Wars film, I think shortly before Disney obtained Lucasfilm. Uh, So... And I think it was denied because Zach didn't want to use really any of the main Star Wars characters. He wanted it to sort of be an offshoot just happening somewhere else in the galaxy. Uh, this new band of rebels. Um, and I think they turned that down. So in this alternate universe, if, if that were to have happened, uh, they would have. I mean, I, I, I guess the 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 imperium would just be the empire and it would just be stormtroopers and whatnot that they're fighting and perhaps if they were just sort of fighting one like star destroyer one section of the empire you wouldn't really get vader you wouldn't get necessarily Mm -hmm. the the big bads but it might be maybe more akin to andor where you get some of the more nuanced kind of um uh uh characters that exist in this in this hierarchy 
So I think it could be cool, but I do think it's better as an independent thing. Uh, personally, I think especially especially once we do see the director's cuts, because I know that it's supposed to be more of a harder, grittier, more violent film than even what we saw. Mm -hmm. I, I think that Zack Snyder needs a more... What's the word I'm looking for? He needs a sandbox to play in that's not confined. And I think that keeping it within the Star Wars galaxy would perhaps confine some of it a bit too much. And even though I love Star Wars and I think there's tons of potential there, I think that giving giving him an entire new universe to play with uh, leaves a lot more for the audience to wonder and and be introduced to uh, over the course of the film. So that would be that would be my answer. Uh, hey, George. Yes. If you could grow one crop on a village in space, much like how the people of Velt grow their grain, or as Zack Snyder calls it, space corn. What crop would you grow on your <laughs> on your on your moon on your space village? Um. Okay, so there's two answers: potatoes for the nutritional value, <laughs> and Venus flytraps to Ooh. to attack my to to attack my invaders. <laughs> um, to, 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 you, you, we'd use them for defense, which is which 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 is which is a fantastic idea. <laughs> But okay, I love it. A hundred percent. Let's let's mix up the order here. I'll ask Keelan a question this time. Hey, Keelan. Yes. Uh, Rebel Moon is Rebel Moon. One of the most fun parts about the movie for me uh, was the incredible like variety of planets that we that, that 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 we saw in this thing. I thought it was they were so creative and so awesome. If yeah. you discovered a brand new planet inside of the Rebel Moon realm. Mm. What would be the coolest or most unique feature of this planet? Oh man. Uh Well, if I came upon a planet that their main export was Venus flytraps, that would be pretty interesting. <laughs> but <laughs> That's great. Um, <laughs> wait, what if you grew them on Venus, George? Uh, then we probably wouldn't be in the Rebel Moon universe. True. true. <laughs> but... I was going to say, then you just call them flytraps. But uh, yeah. anyways. <laughs> no, so if I were to discover... Oh, man. First thing that comes to mind is uh, is if there was sort of a planet that had some effect similar to the Northern Lights, like Aurora Borealis, but always everywhere. If if somehow their proximity to their sun or whatever created in their atmosphere just really absurdly stunning skies all the time, uh, I don't know. That's the first thing that comes to mind. That would be that would be really cool. It could be geographically maybe similar to Earth, but just like the skies would be just stunning all the time, just bursting with color year round. Uh, I think that'd be cool. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yes. Yeah. Hey Noah. Yeah. If you could wield any weapon from Rebel Moon or any sci-fi franchise, we're opening it up widely here. Wow. What what would your weapon of choice be? Actually, let's let's narrow it a little bit. If you if you were to obtain a weapon from any sci-fi universe and use it as part of the alliance in Rebel Moon, like you were to join their team with this weapon alone as your as your uh your claim to power what would it be optimus prime <laughs> <laughs> i'll let now um, i'll let now keep going now <laughs> well assuming i have the power to wield it mm. um i would probably choose the infinity gauntlet Ooh. um <laughs> listener noah just pulled his life-size infinity gauntlet <laughs> into, the, into the camera <laughs> Um, I mean, purely because, I mean, when we first saw it in action, and if we're counting, you know, the MCU as, uh, science fiction, yeah. um, it, it's kind of hard to beat the power of the universe in the palm of your hand, you know, like it's kind of, this is quite... true, this is true. <laughs> I mean, infinity gauntlet versus or, uh... club. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that club one hit everyone. Yeah, for <laughs> real. <laughs> um, 
But it was I it was I was between that or Mjolnir because then I would just get the powers of Thor if it were like the mythological standing of it or mm. like the, the the true you know he who wields the hammer shall be granted the powers of Thor what whatever the the line yeah. is yeah but no I think I think I would go with the Infinity Gauntlet mm-hmm. um, assuming it's not a detriment to me when I'm wearing it right. like it was to yeah. Thor. Or it was to Bruce Banner, yeah, true. Yeah, I said Thor, didn't I? <laughs> Whoops, I meant the Hulk. <laughs> I just, I just fully went along with it. I didn't even question it. <laughs> um, uh, all right, so, Noah, yeah. you want to hit us with one more, and then we jump into yes, our next sir. segment. All right, George, how are you doing? Yes, today? I'm. I'm doing great. Is that my question? No. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I, I kind of was was sticking to the Star Wars part of this. And uh, what characters do you think would translate well into a Star Wars story? Ooh. So you had to pick a character from Rebel Moon and put them in the Star Wars universe. Who do you think would be the best or translate the best? Good question. Most na- most naturally, I'd yeah. probably say Noble. Um, mm-hmm. I see like a lot of I I see a lot of similarities between him and some of like the other like yep. I'd say I don't want to say lesser known admirals but like less mainstream like Star Sorry. Wars villains like kind of like Thrawn in um or or, or or some of the other folks in um in, in 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 Star Wars that would be my first choice my second choice would probably be Kai. I could see Kai be being a being a character in a movie very, very yeah, like, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. like 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 I, I could totally see him because just because that that archetype as well plays so well under like the under like a oppressive rule. I think mm-hmm. that I think that Kai would Kai would be a natural fit as well. Yeah. But that brings us to the end of the <laughs> Of of the question speed round, and now it is time to jump into our main discussion. Do you want to kick it off, Keelan? <laughs> oh, absolutely. All right, listeners. Uh, yeah, this is this is the part where we just we forego the question structure and we we just jump straight into an open discussion of the film, our thoughts, our reactions, our our emotions felt during and after experiencing this this uh, this piece of entertainment. So. I I as as a fan of Zack Snyder, I have to praise the composition throughout the film. Uh, I think that that's something that even even Zack Snyder haters uh, agree upon is that this man frames his shots well and visually. Uh, this definitely satisfied me. It was the color palettes were were great. Um, the the uh, cinematography overall. I thought was just beautiful to look at. I like the environment that was established on Velt. Uh, I thought that it was very distinct. The the colors of the sky, the 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 space corn. Because uh, I know that <laughs> I know that Zach and and the Stone Quarry, his his company, actually grew a full field of of corn to shoot. That wasn't that wasn't a CGI or whatever. So I thought I don't think I, I knew they, that. Yeah, which is really cool. I, I they they basically built a whole village uh all the all the homes and everything it was all built from scratch which to me is really fascinating um and did they so like, did they did they build it in like a community in need like maybe maybe <laughs> this they could be like dual purpose <laughs> Wait, could be. I mean, yeah they I'm just not... built a village <laughs> i think I, I don't i don't know if the village still stands or or if it's being repurposed now I'm, i have no idea how how that works um <laughs> but i guess that gets more into set design than than composition but i think uh, I was also rewatching uh, some scenes from the film today, and yeah, just just I I just love those just epic uh, cinematic shots, you know, where where every every character is framed very meticulously. You have beautiful environments behind the characters. You have layers of of uh, whatever it may be, dust or or just um, sort of gritty textures in the foreground. It's it's just very well composed and that's something that that has evolved over the course of his films uh and i thought that this this one was no exception it was it was very beautiful to look right at. yeah no and one one of the biggest things for me in terms of like the visuals and everything was like the real 
close up like hand to hand combat. Yeah. You know, like in in like the the first few minutes where like all the soldiers after they've, you know, they're trying to set up camp, they start going after Sarah and like you see you're actually able to tell what's going on in the fight because it actually slows down. Like I think mm-hmm. the way they use the slow motion after like big hits worked yes. so well. And that's yeah, a lot of yeah. or that that is a very big issue that I noticed a lot of major um movies having like in like in Mar- like mcu movies when it, specifically with like black widow who can't really do anything else mm. um <laughs> it, it just moves so fast that you 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 hear the punch sound and you right. acknowledge that there was a punch but you don't really get to see it yeah. you know like because everything is just moving so fast and so blurry that you can't necessarily tell how hard it's being hit but with this one with rebel moon you can feel the power, <laughs> you know, yeah. like you can, you can see just how hard it was. Um, and I thought that was fantastic personally. I agree. I, I think the slow motion uh, lends itself very well to fight scenes. I think it, uh, it, it, to me, I, I heard someone on the internet made this analogy that it, it gives a similar effect to reading a comic book because it's almost oh. as if you're going panel by panel where each each panel is is very uh much like a, a one punch is is a panel and then the next panel is a different angle so it's almost like each of the slow mo shots is like a panel and what happens in between is sort of the the gutter in between the panels which is i think is kind of a cool yeah, analogy yeah i had, it, I, i've never thought of that yeah That's it gives you it gives you time to actually absorb like you said the punch of now we're in this position and now we're in this position. And uh, yeah, so I think it works well in, in, in the DC films and it, I thought it worked really well in this. I, can we talk about the, the uh, fight choreography of Korra's first battle on Velt? When yes. She <laughs> goes against the soldiers. Like I thought, I thought that was, that really set the stage for the rest of the movie. That was like, oh, okay. So she means business. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's always like, it's always good to see whenever, um, I think some of the most impactful scenes, like like especially early on in the movie, are done when you bring when you when you bring an incredible amount of like, attention to detail in a very simplified setting. And I think that like just straight up a barn, it was the <laughs> simplest thing that you could imagine. It was an incredibly <laughs> tense situation. It was like they like the build up to like the build up to that scene as well was was also incredible. When it came when it came along, it felt sudden, but it also felt very like it also felt very like expected and also like inevitable at the same time. Um, it was, it, it, it was very well done. The emotions were running high and it just added right into the amazing choreography. Um, so I think I, I, I would hundred percent agree. I mean, that was, that, that was perfectly fantastic. <laughs> I, I will say um, one thing that I found most interesting um, with this movie was the use of time. Mm. Um both mm. both on the part of like how both both on the part of like within the film and like straight up the film itself because the contents of the film spread over over the cor- over the course of a little bit of time but they 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 jumped they jumped backward in time they told stories from um fr- from long, from like years and years and years ago um up until like like memories that happened in the short term yeah and that was and that was really interesting i also thought even more interestingly was, and I mean, it, it ties right into the title of the film. We got a movie literally called part one. The <laughs> last, like the, like the last time I remember this happening was like, um, like the last, like the last um, movie in the, um, in the hunger games, in the, in, in, in the mm-hmm. hunger Games series where yeah, yeah. they split up walking Jay into, into two movies. And I, I right. still remember that. I still remember, um, how 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 frustrating and also cool it was to experience only the first part of something um mm-hmm. i also remember how how interesting it was to see especially with this director who has a history of making incredibly long movies <laughs> <laughs> i think i think i still think that the that this that that's the snyder cut is definitely the longest like single movie that i that i think i have ever seen um yeah I thought I thought that it was very interesting to see how this how that kind of started to play into his style 
And now, like as you had mentioned earlier in the film, uh, or earlier in the podcast, earlier in the podcast, <laughs> um, we're, we're we're receiving two director's cuts with almost like six whole hours worth of footage. Yeah. Um, so it's it's incredible to see how the entire industry is kind of shifting more into this mini series model um, of like we want to release content, we want to release more content, break it up a little bit more so that people can digest it, but the idea that um, the idea that two hours isn't exactly enough time to tell us to, to tell a story of this kind of caliber right now is, is I think an incredibly interesting, um, interesting insight into like how, how I approach looking at this film. Yeah, I agree. I, I, <clears throat> and we can just touch on briefly the release model for this film is something that has garnered a lot of attention and criticism because a lot of people have said, why would you, uh, you being Netflix, why would you bring on Zack Snyder, who is notorious for long movies and yeah. long, violent, vulgar movies, especially, and try to uh, cut it down into a shorter project um, and make it and have a PG-13 mandate? Because that is what happened. His His original plan was for it to be very hardcore rated R inspired by, I think he said the heavy metal comics, which I haven't read them, but I think they are notoriously very sexual, very violent. And he wanted that to be very prevalent in the film. And Netflix, yeah. I think wanted a more marketable sci-fi film, sort of a star Wars competitor of let's put out something that, that anyone can watch, which again, from a business standpoint makes sense, but then you encounter this this issue that Zach seems to have with every studio he goes to of they take his very ambitious, uh, very adult plans and make it into something more marketable. And then a lot of the criticisms that people have often are a result of that. And with the Snyder Cut being such a famous phenomenon, you'd think that Netflix would be weary of <laughs> cutting his films in any capacity mm -hmm. uh so and and i think i mean personally i think with the exception of justice league because justice league is a totally different story i think most of his theatrical cuts are fine i think that this movie was good i think that bvs the 30 minute shorter version was was also good uh i think the extended cuts i like them more but i think the standardly i think they're fine this one i'm really curious about though I'm curious what that director's cut is going to look like because it adds an hour. I mean, that's this is this one is two hours. The director's cut is take half of that and then add that on again. Like that, that's a lot more movie. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm really curious what that's going to look like. Uh, so, what what are your guys' thoughts on the release model of saying, okay, we're gonna we're gonna break first, we're gonna break it up into two movies. We're gonna put a time and a rating mandate on each of those movies we're going to release these and then we'll let you have your director's cut where you get to make it exactly how you want it. Then we'll let you do that. Uh, what do you, what do you guys think about that? I think that it, it, it kind of feels to me that they're kind of jumping on the, the release, the Snyder cut train just a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, like they're, they're yeah. making him, trim down what he wants and then marketing the director's cut and then like the extended version and then the big right. release of it all, you know, like that, that has kind of become synonymous with, with Zack Snyder because of yeah. the justice league and release the Snyder cut and that movement that you played a very big part in. Um, oh, thank you. I did try. I did try. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that, that's just kind of how it feels to me. Like they're just, doing that for the marketability of it like hey look at this thing that was like real popular a few years ago and that garnered a lot of attention and we're gonna do that to that exact same director <laughs> <laughs> yeah the the difference is that they agreed upon with him in the beginning contractually right we will release your director's cut after we do our after we put out the version that works for us um so it, it, he he's not going through quite as much emotional turmoil regarding the project, right. but it, but to the to the outside to the to the public, absolutely. Uh, 
people are like, hey, give us the give us the Snyder Cut, basically. So they are sort of trying to perhaps simulate that outrage. Um, but I don't think right. it would and be I- quite as effective because it's not with it's not with the DC characters. These, this is all new characters. So we don't know right. what they have in store. We don't know what what the extra hour is. We have no idea. But I, I mean, I'm not saying that it's necessarily a bad thing. Those are just some parallels that I that I drew with this whole situation. I think it's, um, I think George said this earlier, but like it gives you time to digest what you saw and to fully yeah. understand and give you time to rewatch it so you could get a better understanding because you're not going to yeah. get a perfect understanding of it the first time you watch it. So yeah. I think with this kind of release model, it is, it is getting the story out in digestible parts with enough time in between where you will be able to really look forward to what happens next. You know, it's not like, Oh, it's a big Avengers movie. That's going to come out next year after this three hour movie that just came out now, you know, it's, it's smaller parts coming out sooner, but not so soon that you're like, well, hold on a minute. How does, I don't remember that from this, from this other one, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you yeah you wouldn't want to, you wouldn't re- want to release Infinity War and Endgame on the same day, right? Basically, yeah, yeah, I, I agree, I agree. I think I think having having the anticipation is is good. Um, even yeah, even if that wasn't the original intention or or whatever, maybe I, I do agree that that the idea of first we get to know the characters, we we have been introduced to this world, we have time to digest, like you said, then we get to a point now we get to see them. Now we get the war movie where they they go and they fight and we get to see the this next installment in the story. Now that we know the characters, we've had time to sit with them. So that I think that's cool. Yeah, I agree. I I think that I think that in terms of like the conditions about the tonality of the movie and um like in terms of like how it like feels like the rating, all of that. I think that was definitely a choice, um, a, a, a difficult choice by him. Um, which definitely impact, which definitely impacted like the final product a lot. I could tell where, like the original version and like the and the, I, I won't say more kid friendly version, but like the like like the more mainstream kind of collided when 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 I saw some of the more like darker elements of the film kind of materialize and then immediately kind of dissipate mm. <laughs> after <laughs> af- after a few seconds. Mm. Um, I would say that. I don't necessarily think that restricting the length of the movie so that it would be released in two parts was in. It was de- like, I'll say it like this. I think it was a very understandable decision by like the Netflix executives. Uh, Cause my, like even my parents, like um, they, they know, they know I love this Snyder cut. They know, uh, they know that it's a, that it's a great film. They know it's high quality. They know because of all of like the hoop, the hoopla about it. They know, uh, they, they, they know that it's a great movie, but every time they look at it, they're like four hours. Oh my God. Absolutely not. Right, um, right. they just, they cannot take the time to sit down and be like, this is going to be my primary activity for the next, um, four hours. It's just too big of like a chunk for yeah. someone to just sit down one way through who isn't like emotionally invested enough to get them over that hump. So right. I'd say that, I mean, this was definitely like a negotiation. Um, but uh, honestly, I'm very happy with the final product. I think that even if um, even if it's not necessarily 100% um, like the original creator's vision, uh, I honestly can't say I know very many creators that have enough um, that have like enough independence in terms of this kind of stuff to really kind of go against um, to go against everything and kind of do every single thing their own way. Um, so I think that it's like it, I think it's a balance and. Overall, I think that it's not necessary. I wouldn't necessarily say that it's always productive, but I think that it has kind of been adopted into the creative process a little bit where you have to, you have to, you have to, you have to create something in your mind. And then you have to take that from idea from that creation into that finished product that's ready to be kind of released. And, um, and like the entire like journey of that is is something that i think that we're especially because of this like incredibly unique style i think that it's um like to be honest it's it's one of the most it's one of the more rewarding things to see here because we have that background and i think that that's also a very interesting layer to this film is is having that um little behind the scenes curtain of like 
yeah, we're paying attention to this guy mm-hmm. because of all the stuff that's happened in the past. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't remember the last time I looked into a director's machinations right. um, <laughs> as, 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 and in as much detail as I have Zack Snyder. So I think that it's, it's, it's very unique and it's very interesting. And honestly, I, I think that this adds another layer of enjoyment to this that I, that I wouldn't have felt uh, if it would have been another director. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think you, you bring up a really interesting point that about how we, we don't even have this expectation for most films of this scale, that it's entirely the director's vision. I think that is Zack Snyder is in a very unique position where he is making films from a very independent mindset, a very artistic mindset but on the scale of massive hollywood blockbusters and that's really unusual like if you think of a lot of the more independent the more art house directors they're not making 300 million dollar films uh because usually those movies if a studio is going to invest that much money into a film like let's go back to avengers they're gonna they're 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 making it by committee they're making it the best movie they can that they can market to the fan base that's going to satisfy everybody there that's what you know that's that's the movie business essentially when you're putting that much money into something you want it to to sell and so we're, you're seeing a person who still has that independent filmmaking mindset in a position of making blockbusters and you're seeing that yeah. direct we're all bearing witness to the clash of artist versus executive on the a really unprecedented scale and i i just think it's fascinating to see uh i do think that zach is much more cordial with netflix than he was with warner bros during all the justice league stuff uh i think that they have a better relationship and they're working more in symbiosis so i'm i'm i'm, I'm curious to see how the rest of these installments roll out but let's let's get back to the content of the film and the story itself uh anybody else have any 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 characters any scenes anything stand out that you want to you want to touch on Oh, I do. So, um, when we see the soldiers taking Sarah to, uh, how should we say, violate her, yeah, you know, and then that, that big fight scene that we brought up earlier uh, with Cora and all the rest of the soldiers is her taking them out. Right. Um, it was established before that, like the 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 robot, the droid. Did he have a name? Jimmy. His name was Jimmy. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that like the soldier or the, the Jimmy was a soldier before the king and queen and princess were murdered. And yes. they even made a comment on it saying they just kind of put down their guns and stopped fighting. But yep. we see Jimmy shoot the like the head guy. Right. You know, and I I just kind of had this realization earlier today that that was probably because of he probably reverted back to those that program because earlier he had told Sarah that he remind or she reminds him of the princess Mm -hmm. you know like is this something that you guys put together before I think I think Sarah is the princess I'm just gonna throw that out there right now no yeah I mean like that's that's definitely been heavily implied I see, but they they showed the princess, and it was different than Sarah. They showed the in, young princess, but as like a as like a child, like many years ago, you know, like this. True, right? Right. This, wait, is, am this I, is just wait, a theory. Am I that right? I don't, I don't know if it was. I don't know if it was. I don't know how heavily it was implied, but I that was just a theory because I didn't think I didn't pick up on that the first time watching, but I thought of it later. Yeah. Well, because I, lo- my... I looked it up, like. I, I was I was experiencing the same uncertainties and I looked it up and it seemed like everyone was like, oh my gosh, this is definitely true. So I was like, I just I just took it for I just took it for a fact. Right. No, and I think originally that was the I think I drew that conclusion or like I had that feeling when um when Keelan, you and I first watched it together, was that mm-hmm. like I'm predicting that she's gonna be the princess. You yeah. know? Like I I would not be surprised. Yeah, by any means yeah. if she did turn out to be the princess but they were they all kept saying that the princess was one of the people that was killed and and that right uh, well so so they so they also establish that an off-worlder came and killed the king and queen and 
they I, didn't say who, right? They said it was someone close to them that uh, they said they killed the princess, the king, and the queen. Right. So my my thinking is it, it might have been Cora. Cora might have been the one who killed them, uh, because then later in the film, I think Noble says to the king that he's about, like the the alien king that he's about to kill. He says the king showed charity to an off worlder, and the off worlder ended up killing them. So if you think about it, Cora is an off worlder who ended up being very close to them. My thinking is that she killed the king and queen and took Sarah with her to Velt. That that to me that that mm. that might make sense. Um and then they just changed her identity. She was no longer the Princess Issa. She changed her name and something like that. I I I I I I, I might be forgetting some of the details of the flashbacks, so I might be totally off base here, but that was just a theory I had. It has, it's been a minute since I watched it as well, but it seemed like that. I, I still don't know why exactly. Um, like that was the intended idea behind all of that. But, um, but I, I, I do remember thinking, um, thinking that, especially because like, at, like, just as you said, no, like when, like when, when that, when that like moment happened, then like immediately I started, I started thinking about that and this, it started being mm-hmm. like, huh, that could that 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 could be true. I think that it's going to become a lot clearer when we see the director's cut. Like, yes. <laughs> unfortunately, I think that that extra hour of footage is probably coming from like background plot, <laughs> as well as like as as well as some really awesome cinematic shots of everything. I, um, I really hope it does go more into the background of a lot of, especially the the more main characters later, mm-hmm. because we only kind of get some few sentence descriptions of who they were before we met them you know like um right the the, the general what, what was his name I oh like general titus. titus titus yeah like yeah, yeah. all we know is that he is like a disgraced general that lost a lot of men in one battle mm-hmm. and that's mm-hmm. that's kind of it you know like i would love to learn more about those backstories and how he became who they know them to be right you know like that that was my one of my biggest I don't want to say complaints, but I don't really don't have a better term of it. I don't feel that strongly about it, but um, it, I just feel like with all of the introduction so quickly of these new characters, I didn't really get a chance to connect with them because I didn't know much about them. Right. Yeah. I, I imagine we will get to spend more time with them. I, yeah. I'm curious to see what the, really wondering what that hour is going to be made up of. Uh Right. How is it just, is it more backstory? Is it that all the scenes are going to be more extended? I'm, I'm curious. Cause I thought that this film, I thought it was paced well. Uh, I didn't, I didn't feel that it was, that it spent too long or too little on anything, but I, I do agree that some of the characters I didn't fully get to form attachments to, uh, right. because we just got a basic overview of who they were. They get recruited. And then we have the, we have the final battle at the end of the film where for most of that battle, they were all just, locked up in those in those droids <laughs> which by the way those droids were cool i like the, the those are awesome killer droids those are crazy <laughs> what a brutal way to go too i know no, i mean i i totally agree that those were really cool um <laughs> no no 100 i think that like because um in like army of the dead the way the way that a lot of the character development worked was they introduced really strong characters and i think that this is a this is an evidence this is evidence of good writing that we want to see more from like the different characters. Yeah. Um, and it's not, it's not simple either. We could, it's very obvious that the characters have layers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe it would be good if we got like a little simple kind of screen for each character for us to look at, like during the main film. But um, like the way that at least like in army of the dead, like there were just like the idea was that there were spinoff movies like after that, that like dived into more of like the character's origins. Like uh, like the safe cracker, for instance. Mm, so yeah, I think right. that that would that would be ex- that would be especially interesting to see uh, something similar to that here, um, where we we got like a little taste of um, of of what each of these characters uh, kind of did before yeah. before going into this before becoming a vigilante. Mm, and right. um, I I honestly just I I have to say the 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 world building in this in this movie was incredible incredible in 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 the sense that it was it it was well done but also in the sense that it was frustrating because i felt like i could watch 
another three hours of, of world building and still be like completely satisfied with my time. <laughs> so um, it, it, it was it was good, but it was also uh, very frustrating because of that. Well, not to worry, my man, you're going to get four more hours of it. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's this actually relates to a point that I made in our last episode about Netflix's Avatar The Last Airbender that I feel a lot of fantasy and sci-fi uh, can sometimes fall short in character relatability. Uh, and And I think that with films like this, it's set in a very unfamiliar galaxy. So they're not, they're not speaking in very relatable ways. Even just the manner of speech is very theatrical, very Shakespearean. And it's not, whereas when you have army of the dead, you can instantly relate to people because of like their sarcasm or their humor or their, their mm -hmm. uh, very human emotions that are grounded in this world. Uh, and, 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 and again, just the way they talk, the way they communicate is, is familiar to us. But in fantasy and sci-fi, it takes a little more work to make you be invested in those characters because they, uh, they are talking and behaving in, in very different ways than we're accustomed to. Uh, but I thought that I thought that yeah, given the time constraints and given the number of characters, I thought that they did the best they could. And um, I, I am yeah. also excited to see more of more of this uh, this band of rebels. One thing I did notice is at, at least at the end. Um, they don't necessarily take deaths seriously. And I, I, I will elaborate more on this because I know there's a lot of death in the movie. But there, there, I feel like there are some battles or some, some deaths that just kind of get glossed over more than they should. Mm -hmm. I feel like, like specifically at the very end, when you know it's real that kai betrayed them all mm. and he's like you have to kill he goes to the farmer guy i cannot remember his name i'm so bad with these characters names <laughs> um he's like you have to kill cora it just yeah. you know put the gun up there snap her neck with it and the farmer's like no and turns around and in like like a half a second you just see him shoot him and then just never address it never see it again you know like he it was a, it was a pretty integral part of the story just for yeah. them to be like oh you're dead and then just move on i i actually it was so quick that i, I i'm struggling to remember it uh him did yeah, he, he did he fully so, shoot kai did he kill kai so yeah so he stuck the the like the, the neck stabby gun yeah up like to his chin and pulled the trigger it was very quick yeah, that was, that was, I, I genuinely, I mean, I've watched the movie twice now and I don't even remember that shot because I think it was right. so, maybe, maybe that's, maybe that's also in the <laughs> extended because that's, <laughs> that's, um, yeah, I don't remember that. Uh, I, cause I remember, I remember wondering at the end of the film if Kai had died or if he had gotten off. Uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, that particular death is not, that was not given much attention at all. You're right. No. And I, I understand much bigger things were about to happen. <laughs> Yeah, but, but still, he was Kai still was the main like, character. Yeah, yeah. He was he was an integral part of the team into actually assembling the team, even if it was right. for malicious reasons. But I, that one, I just felt like it was really, really glossed over and not made a yeah. big deal of. Yeah, that is. Yeah, because they didn't address it after the fact. Yeah, that's true. No. Yeah, man. George, did you realize that he died? I did. I I vaguely remember what you're talking about. Um. I do. I I remember. Rem, I remember thinking. Okay, so he like got his just like he got his like ending or whatever. But um, I think that the the entire style of this movie was also very fast paced. It was very like I I don't want to say messy, but it was definitely it was definitely it was chaotic <laughs> in in a very deliberate way. There's a so, method to the madness. Yeah, exactly. So I think that what we're what we're seeing what we're seeing here is probably a, a difference in style that may or may not um that may or may not be exactly what we're accustomed to but i don't think like at least for me i i very much acknowledged while i was watching the movie that it was different but i didn't i didn't necessarily see that as a bad thing i just had to kind of adjust to it in the first like 15 minutes and then i kind of move forward mm -hmm. it it just felt a little inconsistent 
I guess is the word, because they spent more time on the death of um who the 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 alien guy that Kai shot at the bar when he first met Cora and and the other farmer dude. You know, like they yeah. stayed on him as he fell back. Mm, they didn't yeah. do that with Kai. You know, yeah. that was <laughs> that was a, a one off character. You know, yeah, who just wanted to have sex with the farm guy. So <laughs> good point. Good point. <laughs> <laughs> it, it that one just kind of felt a little more inconsistent like if you're going to spend at least a second on that death why not a much bigger bigger point in the story right right yeah i'm not sure i mean yeah again i don't even i i just was such in, it went by so fast <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i just hope they find a way to address it in the new content that's being released because i would yeah. love to know more about how it really affected them all right speaking of 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 deaths um darian blood axe bit the dust very quickly yeah i am really curious because i think there was a shot of him in the trailer for part two so i'm wondering if we get a flashback or something i don't know uh because he i mean he was dead dead like we saw him all the way dead uh and and (laughs) i thought that was very definitely a subversion of expectations because he had just been introduced and was this legendary revolutionary one of the two main rebels in the galaxy and then in the very first time we see him in combat he dies right (laughs) so which was very surprising also especially like knowing that he played cyborg and knowing that he has the relationship with Zack snyder i think people were extra extra i mean myself included was very surprised to see him just get get killed so quickly i definitely thought he would be a very big part of the second part but yeah i thought he was cool though i thought he looked cool sounded cool yeah no he looked the 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 makeup on on the blood axis was awesome i thought it was great yeah 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 Yeah, i mean i thought that a, a lot of this was fantastic i think that it was I, it 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 just I, for me it all comes back down to that stylistic difference. When when you see some when you see a character like that just get immediately like like <laughs> yoink like 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 yoinked and like the last and <laughs> in, in, in the in in the, in the first like few seconds of like an important event, I like it always like it it throws you. Um, it feels a little bit. It feels a little bit less. Um, it feels a little less clean than like a lot of the like the bigger mainstream like fight thing fight as mm-hmm. kind of things but to be honest to me it seems a lot more realistic yeah it kind of breaks true. down right. it, it 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 breaks down that um that barrier that i um that i have like implicitly of what i'm watching as a movie mm-hmm. versus like i'm seeing an event that's mm-hmm. happening um and i'm like i'm along for the ride there right, so i think right. that it's 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 interesting to see like it, for me it's almost breaking the breaking the what fourth wall i think that's the that's the expression where it's yeah. like it's not necessarily that like they're addri- like that the movie's addressing me in the audience but when when something like that happens that it's incredibly real life mm-hmm. um i think it definitely pulls it definitely pulled it pulled me in significantly more into into what was going on it confused the heck out of me because again up until that point i was very much watching a movie um but or at least i was uh for like the last hour yeah. <laughs> um but it's always it's always uh it's always a good time <laughs> yeah yeah uh all right folks before we jump into our last segment here i would also just like to make a a quick statement on the critical reception of this film so yeah since since bvs i think i think there has been a a bias amongst critics uh towards Zack snyder and for the record i i have i have said time and time again that i have no issue at all with anybody disliking any film. I think, of course, everyone is entitled to their opinion. Uh, I There are films by very great directors that I personally don't like. There are films by, you know, more more commercial, uh, unartistic films that I, I do love a lot. So there's, there's everything on the spectrum. Like, everybody is entitled to their opinion is all I'm saying. But when it comes to a lot of, a lot of films... Uh, like this one 
Um, and another film I'll, I'll loop in that I think we've all seen is The Creator by Gareth Edwards. This was another sci-fi film that was yes. released. Was released. Such uh, a good film. Yeah, it was released last year. So when it comes to, uh, I think, directors in, in similar positions to Zack Snyder, where they are releasing these very artistically driven films on a big scale, I think there is a very unfair treatment of them in, in the press. And I think, and I haven't quite been able to put my finger on why, but it, it's, 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 it's very interesting to me that they are held to a much higher standard than just your average film. For instance, Rebel Moon received on Rotten Tomatoes, I believe the score was one third of the scores of Trolls 3. <laughs> you know, Trolls 3 <laughs> uh, massively outperformed <laughs> Rebel Moon in terms of, in terms of uh, uh, the critical reception, which to me speaks to, I mean, listen, no, no shade at all to anybody who put their heart and soul into the third Trolls film. I have no doubt that uh, it was, you know, a labor of love for many people. However, Trolls 3 is a much more marketable, mainstream, family-friendly, let's just keep putting out a concept that we know works and let's let's keep selling it, right? And it's 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 interesting that people complain so much, a lot of consumers complain that we're getting such repetitive content that the studios keep regurgitating these same concepts and keep giving us the same thing. But yet, whenever we get something that is a departure from that, whenever we get a Rebel Moon or something like The Creator that is, hey, let's do something different. Let's create a whole new world. Let's uh, let's introduce new characters. Let's let's take take this genre and 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 subvert expectations. Then suddenly, the critical bar is so much higher, and it's comparing it to, well, this isn't as good as Star Wars. So it's trash or, you know, it, this, this didn't meet this very, uh, high expectation of, of artistic value. So we're going to, we're going to say that it, it failed when, when other films are getting a pass simply for having some basic entertainment value, even if it's the same concept that we've seen a million times. So this, this is, I mean, I could argue why I think there's a bias against Zack Snyder, but I think. I think there is an unfair treatment of of a lot of directors like him. Uh, and I think it's the reason that we keep getting, I mean, I think that the reaction to films like BVS is the reason that we get films like Shazam Fury of the Gods. <laughs> you know, we get films <laughs> be, because... When Sorry, artists... that, wasn't, that, wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't based off of your point. I just thought that that was... <laughs> it, keep, keep going, keep so going. When, yeah, whenever critics tarnish yeah. a film that that uh was just a director doing a distinct interpretation even if they don't vibe with with that vision or that version of the characters they're essentially saying we don't want difference we don't want an artistic interpretation we just want the same thing and then they want to turn around or at least the the consumers the viewers uh uh will turn around and say hey why are we getting films like like this, that's, that's just like a, a corporate product, <laughs> you know, that doesn't even right. feel like it has a soul. And um, again, I, I, I also want to clarify, no shades, anybody who worked on Shazam Fury of the Gods, I actually like that director, David Sandberg, but I do feel that he didn't get, I, I feel that it was missing a lot of his essence, because I think that I think that we're seeing the pendulum swing away from directors getting to put their thumbprint on projects because of very biased, very unfair critical reception. So I just want to throw that out there. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. And I think a big reason for that in terms of critical is that the, the culture that I have felt for a while is that we don't want anything new. We want to build on stuff that's already been established, you know, even if it means, you know, making a sequel or even a reboot, which has been very popular lately. You know, right. like, especially for some of the shows that we, that were on when we were growing up, like iCarly, there was that reboot that lasted a season. And then people were like, this is kind of awful. And then they just trashed it, <laughs> you know? And, um, oh, there's another one. There's another one. Um, I think Wizards of Waverly Place is also getting a reboot, yeah. mm -hmm. which I'm personally excited for that. I think, you know, seeing Selena Gomez back on the, on the, on the big screen. 
I'm perfectly fine with that. But <laughs> no complaints uh, over here. <laughs> <laughs> I I think that that's what the industry is moving towards, and I am personally, I feel like it's really saturated that market, right? With 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 sequels and nothing original and new, but with the new generation of of, of kids that are growing up, especially with those other kids shows that or other shows that we were watching as kids, they're trying to reach that demographic too. So they're, they're, they're trying to build on something rather than make something new. And I, I agree with you with what you're saying. Like, that's not where they're, they're not wanting anything new. They, they don't, yeah. they don't want new stories. Cause they're, they were like, well, we're not sure if this is going to work, but we know we have for a fact that, you know, old iCarly was a hit, you know, right. right it's just right. a guaranteed way to make money if you can stick a successful name on it already. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we live in the era of mass reboots and remakes and, and, uh, and don't revival. even get me started on the new Mega Man movie or Mega Mind. Mega Mind. Mega Mind. No, we're not even going to talk about that. <laughs> Mega Mind versus the Doom Syndicate. That no, no, thank you. I'm so yeah. sorry. I, I just, it, it, it's all just really starting to feel to me as someone who really enjoyed those shows and those movies as a kid like a cash yeah. grab. That's it. That's all it is. Exactly. Exactly. Which, which is why I think that as a culture and, and, and this is speaking to critics and consumers, I think that even if you, again, if you, even if you don't like the film, even if it's not your cup of tea, we have to acknowledge that it's a cool thing when a director just puts their heart out there and says, I'm going to, I'm going to make, I'm going to make right. something different and cool. And I mean, for, for instance, uh, Wes Anderson recently came out with the film Asteroid City. I saw it. I, I know Wes Anderson is a, is a true, you know, artisan of his craft. I didn't much care for the film. It was hard for me to follow. Uh, it, it, it wasn't my style of film narratively. Um, but I could tell that it was, it was, a. Uh, it was something he, he put his heart into. I, it was a it was a piece of art. It was something that he worked hard on. That 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 it didn't feel like it didn't feel like a studio mandate. It didn't feel like a cash grab. It felt like it felt like a, a creator made something, <laughs> which feels like that should be the bare minimum for a movie. But unfortunately, the majority of movies I see, uh, you know, nowadays are it doesn't you don't feel the presence of the people that made it and the people that wanted to make it. It feels it feels as if it was just, it was just a, something on the schedule, something that they, that the studio ordered to be made. And, and, and that, yeah. <laughs> if I, can I interject here for just a minute? Yeah, of course. That's part of, this is getting just a little bit off topic, but still on par with what you were just saying. That's where YouTube was, a, is still a really big thing. Mm. You know, especially like individual people, you get that connection, you get, you understand that they are the ones doing this, not right. a big team of like corporate people. But th it, it was them. It was what they wanted it to be. They had complete control over it, and that's why a lot of a lot of them are really, really successful. Yeah, and I, I think that Hollywood needs to go back to that. Otherwise, they're just gonna keep floundering for money, and they're gonna have these big blockbuster movies that are just busting all the time. Yeah, <laughs> just busting yeah. blockbusters, busting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 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 I heard, I think it was Tarantino said something about how uh, it, it's always, the pendulum is always swinging in Hollywood and you kind of see it across decades where you'll have a decade where the the directors have more say and then you have a decade where it feels much more corporate, much more uh, commercialized. Right. And And I think that when you get, when you hit a certain extreme, which I think we are unfortunately getting close to hitting that extreme of of a, a lot the of the newer marvel movies the newer yeah the newer the newer <laughs> yes. marvel and dc movies i mean i think the state of animation 3d or uh, cgi animation is is crazily oversaturated with the same exact type of humor and stories yeah i think that i think that sure let's let's keep the family friendly uh you know uh, uh, kid movies let's keep those alive those have a lot of value um but animation as a whole has so much untapped potential that they're just not exploring because it hasn't been verified to be profitable yet. Um, if, if we so, do another episode on a movie, um, it doesn't have to be the next one, but if we do another one, I would love to do the Spider-Verse movies. 
<laughs> Into the Spider. Oh, that would be a great one. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. that animation, like what you were saying, just reminded me of that. That animation is so fantastic. Yeah. It's so like good. I get, and fantastic's not even the right word because it doesn't. It's sublime. <laughs> it doesn't. It, it's, it's, <laughs> It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's so good. It's so good. Uh yeah. So so that that being said, um I think I think uh I think my, my I think my point really in summary was was just that I I think that we should we should uplift films and and give a fair chance to films that are that are of this nature. Um because when when we, whenever we just jump on the bandwagon of 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 hate and and criticizing uh uh, any any movie like this i think that i think that we run the risk of perpetuating that demand yeah. for commercialized <laughs> repetitive storytelling in hollywood uh so yeah all right so that was such a great discussion on on rebel moon and our, our feelings on the movie and our, our overall thoughts on hollywood as a whole as we got there at the end um Indeed. but now no i got some deep questions for y'all some real real Ooh. real noggin rackers some some real <laughs> some real think pieces you know noggin rackers so no, <laughs> i'm improv here man no. give me give me a break um so i i i will go ahead and start off i'm fine with doing that um george i have a question for you all right because there's this i have a specific note on this question pertaining to you <laughs> um so at the end of the movie uh Tarek, the um the shirtless guy um, makes a comment saying that the, the, the farm world, I can't remember the name of it, um, is a beautiful place to die. Right. So if you were to have a battle where you knew you weren't going to make it out, where would you want that battle to take place? And the note I have on here says you can't say you wouldn't go to the battle. <laughs> OK, yes. Uh, that's that's a it's a, it's a good condition that does sound like a smart ass thing I would so where would say. be your beautiful um, place to die my beautiful place to die oh my gosh that's a good question it's a real noggin i'd probably racket, I, I i'd probably say <laughs> the the <laughs> i'd probably say the city that i was uh the city where i was born um in in Skopje, macedonia um, not necessarily because, um, of like the battle itself, but because whenever I have, um, whenever I travel there, like whenever I go there, um, I always have like a feeling deep in my heart that like, that I'm from here, like this is my home. Um, and I think that if there was a battle there, I would probably want to be a part of it uh, in, in, in one way or another. <laughs> and, yeah. um, if I was, uh, if, if I were to, 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 to pick a place to go, um, that would, I, I would probably want to be in, in a place where my heart was full. So I'd say there. Good answer. Nice. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, okay. So, hey, Keelan. Yes. Hey, I, I have a, I, I, I have a, I have a question for, for you. It's better be a good melon scrambler right here. I'll tell you what. <laughs> yeah, it's going to. It's, 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 it's really, I mean, your, your, your brain's going to be a punching bag for this question. Um, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Hey, <laughs> You're about to get a hemorrhage from this question. <laughs> hey, Keelan. I'm ready. We, we, we got to see some incredibly complicated character archetypes in Rebel Moon. Yes. And I want to, I want to ask you what vulnerabilities do you think rebel moon characters show that resonate with you on a personal level? Mm, that's interesting. So, I mean, the first one that comes to mind, it, this one, this one actually doesn't pertain to me, but I, but I, I, I noticed it a lot was the, was with Cora's uh, hesitancy to, to feel love and her whole thing about being a child of war I think I'm on the complete opposite spectrum of that. I <laughs> very easily form attachments to people and am very open to love. And I think, uh, but I think that's a really common character trope uh, of people having walls up and, 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 and they have to, that has to be broken down in order for them to let their vulnerable self express. So that one, even a, 
Jesse Reyes, who performed at the event, she she has her song, A Child of Fire, was about that very thing, about being scared to fall in love. Um, so that one that that just comes to mind. I just wanted to mention that. But as as far as one that as far as one that I relate to, uh hmm. Well, I mean, I relate to General Titus in that I too led my men into battle and lost them all to the Imperium. So that I mean, that was <laughs> <laughs> yeah i really you know we've all been there um <laughs> george can you can you hit me with some of the some of the vulnerable traits i'm trying to think of of, of some that, that that might pertain to me uh because they all again they all these are characters that i that resonate with me but aren't aren't super relatable in the sense that they are operating on such a grand level uh in this story that it's it's yeah. hard for me to find points of of actual relation i mean a hundred percent i'd say that being a protagonist in one of these in one of these films there has to be like a level of self-doubt i mm-hmm. think that we also saw that um we also saw that in the character i think it was well portrayed right i'd say overconfidence in the part of the antagonists i think that an incredibly like arrogant admiral um mm-hmm. is definitely is definitely a trope in in, in these kinds of things yeah fear yeah. of loss I'd say, um, is, is, is something that is something that we, that we could, that we could touch on maybe a desire for redemption, like that we definitely saw when it came to the, when, when, when it came to like certain people who had experienced like failures. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Like general Titus. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. General Titus. Yeah. And then just like feelings of like isolation or feelings of like, maybe that we didn't necessarily, um, that, that that maybe like especially um for the one for the one villain um who we who we saw um i cannot remember her name um but uh, the one that nemesis the nemesis fought this the spider lady yes yes yeah the one the spider lady <laughs> yeah um, spider lady. This, the, the, the role of the role of ice the role of isolation and the role of attachment and yeah like, instinct when it came when it comes to, when it came to that i thought that those were interesting vulnerabilities well, but you, you, uh, we can we can pass it on to the next question oh no 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 actually with, yeah go ahead with i was to say with the spider lady uh um uh, a balance between avenging and revenge yeah you know like there, yeah. there's a fine line that you got to do to like either take revenge or honor the people that have been killed right or like that you that you've lost yeah, or with Titus, there was redemption or revenge was the, right. the dichotomy there. Yeah, I thought that was cool. Yeah, actually, so yeah, thank you, George, for that very comprehensive list of all the <laughs> motifs from the film. <laughs> he really had that ready to go. Um, <laughs> I, off the dome. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I actually think I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have thought I would find myself relating to the Spider Lady by any means. But now that you mentioned the themes of isolation and attachment, I think that as someone who, uh, I, I, like I said, I, I I do form attachments easily. Uh, not as easily as a spider lady that's like abducting children or whatever she was doing. Uh, but I do, <laughs> <laughs> I do, um, I do form attachments. I do find myself uh, feeling socially isolated sometimes, which can often be my own doing because of my <laughs> very introvertedness. I, I feel like I form just stronger attachments to select people, such as the two of you, very, very good friends, trustworthy people. Um, but I do think, I do think with with that comes comes a fear of loss. And when you when you just put your your love and trust into a select few people, each of those people mean a lot more to you. And you you know it's kind of the 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 saying of like four quarters versus a hundred pennies. Like those four quarters mean a lot more to you. And uh, again, I'm not sure if this directly pertains to the Spider Lady, but with those themes that you mentioned. Uh, I do feel like that is a vulnerability uh, that I that I might have of of putting a, a, a good deal of of, uh, of faith and a good deal of my my energy and my myself into um, just a select few people that I love and trust, which one might argue is a is a vulnerability worth having. So, anyways, uh, Sir Noah Boink, yeah, I got one for you. What cause? would you be willing to die for? Wow. All right. 
that is a loaded question. If because... I didn't care about this sure MV7 microphone, I would drop it. <laughs> <laughs> Huh. That's that's really really tough because as much as I hate to admit it, I am not necessarily a fighter. Mm. You know, like I I I tend to really avoid conflict. Like if I if my meal is wrong, I'll be like, hey, um, I I wanted like fries instead of like these chips that I got. Is there a way that you could do that? Like I'll do that. But if someone's like hey square up i'm gonna be like i'm just gonna walk this way sorry nope (laughs) it's okay (laughs) um so me actively getting into like actively involving myself in a conflict is not something i've necessarily thought about before Mm. um but uh if i'm willing to go with like a joking answer it would be that avatar the last airbender is not an anime (laughs) Um, that's the cause like if someone were like you have to admit that it's an anime or you die i'm gonna die but (laughs) no you're no you're you're laying down your life for that (laughs) yes um but in like serious you know like real world uh conflicts that actually matter to humanity um i mean there there, there's a lot of of oppression in the world you know so much so that we're kind of what what's what's the one i'm looking for not dissociated from it but i guess dissociated from it because we're just desensitized to it that's that's what i'm that's what i'm looking for because there's we just always hear about these negative things and so picking one of those things is hard to just die for right um and i know i'm rambling on here but i'm really just trying to come up with an answer to this question no you're good Um, take your time um damn feel free to cut out a lot of this silence um (laughs) i would say just endangerment of those close to me you know yeah, it's not necessarily like a cause like a ch- like a, a, a charity you know but if i i have definitely thought of scenarios just like every other man every other well i should not make that generalization that is not going to go down well um <laughs> but like if someone were to day. break <laughs> in if someone were to break in and threaten me and Abby and, and, uh, and Dalen, mm-hmm. uh, who I don't know if I mentioned her son or like, say you, all three of us were hanging out and someone were to come in through your basement and threaten us. I would absolutely make sure I'm the first one on whoever's there. Damn. So. I mean, I'm the heaviest. Yeah, so like, I feel like it should be me. <laughs> physically pouncing. <laughs> I'm the fastest. Person. It's fine. He won't know what hit him. <laughs> I've, been, I've been training. I can beat that lemon in a race. So uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a reference that would <laughs> that's take a too long to explain right to there. the listener. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I would say that is what I would be most willing to lay my life down for is the, the protection of those I, I love and care about. Yeah. True Liam Neeson. I love it. So, um, Keelan, I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to you so I can be able to ask each of you a question. Bring it on. Um, this isn't necessarily deep, but more just getting your insight on what you want to see in part two of of this uh, of this series. Oh yeah. Uh, given the bond that we see formed between Sarah and what was it, Jimmy? Mm-hmm. You know, what do you think would be the best way to continue their relationship or like their, their friendship or, or whatever into part two. Mm, that's interesting. Uh, ah, man, I feel like that really depends on the direction that they go with Sarah's character. If she really is secretly the princess is, Issa. Or, what do you want to see? 
What do I want to see? Yeah. <sighs> hmm. I mean, I yeah, I love. I love just that that scene where Sarah creates sort of the um, <clears throat> the crown of flowers for him, and then he blushes, <laughs> robotically blushes. I think that <laughs> I really like that scene in that in that she is um, she is sort of uh, humanizing Jimmy or or uh, telling him that he doesn't have to be just a product of war, uh, which is which is which is cool, and it's it's similar to. Uh, there's the scene in the in the 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 class like the very first Universal Studios Frankenstein film like the the very early black and white one where Frankenstein is by the river and a girl like puts flowers in his hair or, and and um and I I think I think it was paying tribute to that in that it was you know that this monster made for war made for viciousness w- was it doesn't have to be that like he can be something else but ironically the thing that he's learning is that he can still fight and he can, but he can fight against the oppressor, not for the oppressor. And at the end right. of the film, we see him wearing those antlers, which I know that's going to get explained in the, <laughs> the director's cut. Uh, so I think that, yeah, I'm really just, yeah, I'm really just excited to see what Jimmy's character arc is. Once we get all of the content in, in, in how, how does he, how does a like mass produced machine of war, learn to make its own decisions and and uh and like dedicate itself to a better cause and i think that sarah can play a role in guiding him along that path in how to use his his uh combative nature for good and what does he do with himself after the war assuming he survives perhaps she could guide him to a to a good place um yeah i'm i love that i love uh you boys know i love a good story of of a of an ai or a, of a robot learning <laughs> yeah, to be human i i love all that stuff um shout out aya from green lantern the animated series shout out ta92 <laughs> from eulogy for a doomed world um we made that movie um yeah so that's, <laughs> that's my thoughts on that <laughs> my thoughts on that. nice plug thank you it's on keelan.com um <laughs> <laughs> now george george so I, I asked noah what cause would he be willing to die for and he said us undeniably us now uh you george i ask you now under what circumstances would you pull a kai and betray your closest allies and peers that is an awful question <laughs> just kidding i'm just messing with you. we all know george has some treachery brewing within him we've seen it <laughs> <laughs> i'd say that the only real way that i could betray anybody close to me is if they had done something or were like considering doing something so incredibly objectively morally incorrect Hmm. that I felt like it was my, it was a greater, I had a greater duty as just like a person living on planet earth to stop whatever was going on rather than, um, rather than my duty to be loyal to like the people who are next to me. And I think that like, if you, if you betray or if you stop somebody early enough, then it's then like it's an easier road to get back to um the level of trust and the level of trust and loyalty that you have uh that you had before but i also think that i mean i I think everybody has a responsibility to um to, to 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 do what they feel is right and that if the people that are closest to us aren't and or if they're if they're if they're doing something wrong i think that it is it is in a sense a a level of loyalty as well to um to 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 be forthright and to be and and to say hey i don't i don't think this is okay i think that we need to i think we need to have a conversation about this and um and yeah i'd say i'd I'd say that that's my answer (laughs) funny i thought you were gonna say for like 
a cash settlement or something, but that's a good answer. Too. <laughs> no, 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 I mean, well, 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 you, well, you're right for, for a sufficient monetary prize. I would also stab everyone <laughs> that I know, but, um, <laughs> but George, no, I, uh, I need to have really, a talk with you really. later. <laughs> no, 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 really, really. what? Oh, oh, we splitting the money. Oh, geez. Okay. No. Um, <laughs> Okay, and I guess I'll 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 end it off with our with our last um with our last question, yeah, which home. is which is fitting. Which is fitting, I'd say. I think um I, I asked did I ask Keelan a question last time or did I ask Noah? I think it's my turn. Okay. I think Well Noah. Noah, this is this 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 is fitting because um Rebel Moon part one ends on a cliffhanger with the potential for the potential resurrection of noble Mm. um how do you think that this like very open-ended kind of ending like influences your expectations for part two Mm. i i I originally took it as they're not done telling his story they're they're using his his resurrection at the end because he definitely was i mean the last scene in the movie was him opening his eyes like gasping for air once he got that weird space stuff put in him. Yeah. But um I I think that they're they're wanting to explore more with his character, which I am actually really looking forward to. I would love to get to know more about him because he as a as a as a villain, very good. You know? Like yeah. I think the like as Keelan said, when he met him in person, he just has a very sinister personality. You know, he just fits in so well as the antagonist. And I think we established Keelan when you and I watched it together that he has played roles in like World War II movies as a Nazi. And we we're just like, yeah. "Yep, that sounds about right." You know, <laughs> yeah, he, he is, was in he was in all the light we cannot see all yeah all the light we cannot see, which was a great yeah great uh, production. Uh, in an incredible book as well. Mm. People should read that book. It's one of my. It's one. It's by Andrew. It's by uh, Anthony Doerr, I believe. Um, oh, really? And uh, it's 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 an it's an incredibly amazing book. Um, one of my favorite authors. So was it? Did he do um, Cloud Cuckoo Land? Yes, like, yes, he did. Yeah. One of my like right now, my absolute favorite book. Nice. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that kind of set my expectation for it being. Or for for part two, or even the the extended version, to go more in depth with him and his relationship to um, Korra's father figure. I cannot remember his name. Um, oh, like Belisarius. Belisarius, yes. Yeah. You know, because we we saw that kind of dynamic when he died and they recovered his body. Um, and I, I I want to see more of that dynamic. See if they bring Belisarius back into it. If he can't succeed in bringing Cora to him, and mm-hmm. just be like, fine, he just pull Thanos and be like, fine, I'll do it myself and just go yeah. get her, you yeah, know. Yeah. Um, so that is kind of my expectation for the the plot of the next movie is that we're going to see more of Belisarius, and that mm-hmm. um, Noble is just going to fail. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's the end of my answer. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Amazingly said, Noah. Um, <laughs> no, this was, this was a great discussion. Uh, yeah, we went, folks, we went a bit overboard here. Uh, we were, we were shooting for an hour. We're going on two hours now. I might trim this down before we release it, but this was an excellent discussion of rebel moon. Part one, a child of fire. Uh, thank you to uh, everyone who is listening. Thank you to our sponsors, George Listom. Vero True Social, Keelan.com, and Keelan Morris. No, 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 no. Our incredibly industrious sponsor, Keelan.com. Yes, absolutely, absolutely incredible. I'm growing like crazy nowadays. Um, they, they're currently the, I think, the number one hottest um, creative site in America. Um, de- <laughs> like, like, like de- definitely approaching around nine to 10 million, down, like, million page views a day. Um, and I mean, I, I, I gotta say, if you're not there right now, there's really no other place you can be. So it's true. Uh, I, I, I definitely suggest that you, that you, that you, that you give them a gander and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and perhaps peruse, uh, peruse the incredible content that, um, uh, 
that, that's being displayed over there. Indeed. Back to you, Keelan. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, yes. Thank you all for listening so much. Um, we will be back at it with another episode very shortly. Uh, and um, yeah, boys, it was it was it was a great time chatting with you. Thanks for thanks for watching the movie with me. Thanks for thanks for being part of this journey. And we'll uh, meet up again, I guess, after part two. What do you say? Me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I trailed out there a little bit. <laughs> I was hoping you'd jump in. <laughs> All right. Peace out, boys. Take care, everybody. Be well. Ah, 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 ah.